Medical specialist Robert Squires, United States Army, Vietnam. Bob served as an Army medic at the 91st Evac Hospital in Chu Lai in Vietnam from 1970 to 1971. Folks, another one of these medical stories. He saw hundreds of patients during his tour there in Vietnam and actually Lou Eisenbrandt, the nurse that I have uh, have on my channel here, she left just about the time Bob was getting there. So he saw a lot of things, folks, a lot of types, types of wounds that he treated and just it changed him. All these veterans, it changed them. You can tell it changed them. Bob wrote a book, A Medic's Tale of Transformation, the Vietnam experience of a, of a medic in Vietnam. And I've got a copy of that. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Robert Squires, A Medic's Tale of Transformation in Vietnam. And uh, if you have any problems with that, let me know. It's a great read. And learn a lot about Bob and his tour there. So Bob, this is your this is your time, brother. He came to me and wanted to tell a story. He had a, a I think a quintuplet bypass, five bypass in his heart, and he didn't know if he'd be around much longer. So thankfully, we recorded his story. Um, he lives in South Carolina. We've got his story now for his family's legacy and for future generations, and another perspective, another keen perspective of Vietnam through his eyes and ears. Bob, thank you for letting me um, interview you and, and trusting your story to me. I really appreciate that. I want to thank all those who are helping support my work. You know, I, I don't know if, I feel like I take time to do that, man. maybe I don't, but it's on my heart right now. So I'm just going to say thank you to those of you who have helped sponsor my stories, helped make it possible for me to continue my work. And this is part of the video, this introduction. I really enjoy this. This takes time and effort, but it's worth the effort. Um, if the cause is great enough, it's worth the effort. But I've done all these interviews over 21 years, folks, a thousand stories, over a, almost a million air miles in North America and parts of the world. I've been to France three times. I've been to Iwo Jima, Japan. I've been to Mexico, Canada, produced two films in Canada. So a lot of blood, sweat, and tears here. And, and those that have stepped forward to help donate or sponsor these stories, I so appreciate you. And I look into that camera, you know who you are. Thank you, I love you for it, and I just appreciate your, your help. And, uh, and even my radio station, KVOH, Voices of History Radio, those of you that help sponsor and keep that on the air. God bless you, God bless you mightily for that. I really appreciate it. And if anybody else is out there, I would encourage you to also become a, a sponsor or, or a donate to this work. There's information you can probably say it better than I can in the video description. Below every video, there's a link. And on every comment, the first comment and all the comments, there's a link to donate. Or you can go to LarryCapetto.com and, and donate there. So it would be greatly appreciated. Going to Arizona here in a couple of weeks. Was going to go at the end of January. Didn't work out. Didn't have the resources. I've got them now. And I'm looking forward to interviewing more veterans down there. That's where I started my work 21 years ago. So it's going to be a very nostalgic trip for me where I started my work with a World War II veteran. So working on another project called Masters of the Air, the real stories. You saw the series with Tom Hanks. This, these are the real stories that that series was patterned off of. So don't be fooled, folks. I know a lot of you like that. I'm not taking away from it, but um, anything to keep history alive. So I heard it was a great series. I haven't watched it, but I've got the real stories. Just like with D-Day, I got the real guys that were there on Omaha Beach not the Hollywood actor. So, okay, that's it. Let's stop. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing these stories as we go forward this year. And uh, again, Bob, thank you. Salute everybody that's helped bring these stories to pass. God bless you.
So Bob, how old are you today? I am 74. Do you ever think you'd be 74? When I was over there, I wasn't quite sure. But <laughs> you don't know. Uh, I find a lot of the Vietnam veterans, they're, they're, they're passing away at an earlier age. I'm surprised. A lot of them in their 70s. I hope that's not going to be you, but um, tell me where you're living right now. I'm retired. I'm living in South Carolina on a golf course near the beach. So that's a little bit of heaven, huh? Uh, life I never dreamed of having when I was a kid, for sure. Yeah. Tell me about, um, well, of course, we're going to talk about Vietnam, but just Prior to Vietnam, you're in high school. I, I'm assuming you're in high school, or did you go to college before you went to Vietnam? Uh, I was an athlete in high school. Uh, lost a chance for college scholarships, so I ended up at Kent State. Uh, did well my first semester. Uh, I was also an honor student. And things kind of went to heck in my second semester. I made some mistakes. Lost a girlfriend and... Uh, didn't get a walk-on position at the uh, college for basketball. Uh, so I lost my deferment. And then by the next March of the next year, when I was 20 years old, I got drafted. So you were drafted. You were in the lottery. I remember you telling me in your book, I read your book, and how that was a lottery you didn't want to win, and you were you were chosen to go to Vietnam. And my friends and I, we had a odd little contest. I happened to win it with a low number of 41. So you're 20 years old, and how soon were you actually on your way to basic training? Uh, it wasn't very long, I think uh, probably a couple months. Uh, I remember uh, going to the induction center in March of 1970. Matter of fact, my girlfriend is now my wife of 53 years saw me off uh, in, in Cleveland. Uh, they were also drafting for the Marines that day. Matter of fact, a guy to the left of me and right of me got chosen, and I was kind of quaking in my uh, shoes, but uh, I was uh, drafted into the Army in March 1970. So you didn't have, okay, well, I, I, this is a question maybe I've never asked, but when you're drafted, do you have a choice of an MOS of the job that you're going to do in the Vietnam or in the in the military? No, how this happened was I went to basic training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I will tell you, I was fairly well prepared. I was in good physical shape. I grew up with hard work and discipline on a farm. Uh, my dad was an avid hunter. I knew how to handle a rifle. I was an excellent marksman. Uh, but when I, I graduated uh, well out of basic, uh, they asked me what, what you wanted to do. And I said, I'd really like to become a medic. I said, I really hope I'd rather be able to save people than to kill them. No, they didn't like that answer, of course. You know, I would have done whatever they, you know, was needed, of course. Uh, but fortunately, uh, they sent me to medical a AIT at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Did you have any prior knowledge of the medical field? Not at all. My, I was in uh, chemical engineering at the time. Matter of fact, I now have a computer science degree. Uh, no, absolutely no experience being a medic. So what was the draw? I mean, why, why, why that? Just because you wouldn't be in a frontline situation or just there must have been. A no, I, you know, combat medics were high on the list of casualties. You know, I kind of had done my homework, so I understood what I was getting into. Uh, it's just my my nature. Even though my dad was a hunter, strange story, he thought I was the worst shot in the world because uh, we go squirrel hunting, and I was always miss the squirrel, the rabbit. And what it was, I was aiming at a different target, which I always hit. And it just was in my nature, you know. So I uh, fortunately it worked out for me. I I will say medical. AIT at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, they gave you pretty thorough training. Uh, I was chosen to go into something called the leadership prep class, two intensive weeks of medical training, leadership training. And then uh, because I was one of the top two graduates, 
they put me in charge of about 80 men for the next 10 weeks of medical training. So I was learning again, both medical skills and leadership skills at the same time. Now the training was nothing like the real thing. No, on the we job, practiced on each like OJT, huh? Yeah, we practiced on each other. That was about it. So and, I'm going to go back a go second. Ahead. Before Vietnam, you're in school. The war's quote starting to wind down eventually. But I mean, even in the mid '60s, late '60s, you're you know junior high in the high school. Were you, did you ever have a thought you'd be in Vietnam someday? No, it was definitely not my plans. Matter of fact, I remember when I was a sophomore so, or so, we kept talking, thank goodness we're only 16. By the time we get out of high school, the war will be over. And then when I was in college, thank goodness by the time we got out of college, the war will be over. And I don't think it ended till 1975. I was already married and working by then. Yeah. I think a lot of the troops started leaving in 72 or so. But okay, yeah. so you, you, you're in your training. Um, you're you're obviously going to go to Vietnam. I mean, you're aware of that, right? Over half the medics in AIT went to Vietnam in my class. Tell me about when you got your orders and, and then the flight over. Okay. Uh, it was within, I think, uh, two weeks of graduating. I got my orders. Called on my girlfriend, said, you want to get married? Kind of a World War II thing. I really didn't think I was going to be coming back, but one of those things, right? And uh, had a two week leave, my honeymoon. A week later, we f I flew out of Fort Ord, California to Alaska where there was a blizzard. A couple of days later, flew into Nang in Vietnam. Well, I read in your book, um, the, the trip over and um, the way you described it in your book, which we'll talk about later, but um, that to me is very intriguing. That trip over to Vietnam and recounting that and remembering that, and and then to just tell me what you. I've always been intrigued by time travel, so we're going to go back mm -hmm. to Vietnam now. We're going to go back over fifty years. Tell me about arriving in country, what you experienced. Okay, so I went from about twenty below in Alaska. To Da Nang, I think it was over 100 degrees, humid. Uh, there was some uh, fighting going on near the air base. So we circled for quite a while, you know, enough to make you nervous. We finally landed and they said, run like heck, you know, to the hangar. Grabbed our duffel bags and ran. And uh, I just remember the smell of the smoke, sound of gunfire in the distance smell of airplane fuel, and a strange other one when we got there, the canvas bags. You know, musky smell of everybody with a canvas bag, you know, with their belongings in them. Uh, and uh, the feeling of, you know, what's gonna happen from here? Because we just still didn't have our assignment. Uh, normally a tour is a year. I know you, were, you stayed 405 days and you extended that, but um, normally it's a year. So did you see faces of people maybe leaving? You're coming in, you're fresh. You're what they call a newbie or a cherry. And you see these 18, 19, 20 year old young men looking like they're 40 on their way out. Did you experience any of that exchange when you got in country? No, our, our processing was pretty fast. I remember we came by the time we came in, it was getting near evening. Uh, they fed us, gave us a bunk. Got us up the next morning and said, you know, get in line. Yeah, uh, you're going to we're going to decide where you go. And you're standing in line, and there, we were all medics in in that particular grouping, and they were coming around. And we went, you know, combat medics were here or there, and then they chose people for the various hospitals, and I was chosen for the 91st attack. So I didn't see. It was pretty quick, and it was kind of surreal, you know. So you went from um, Da Nang to Chu Lai? Uh, yeah, we got on, I think, a deuce and a half. We loaded up. We had to drop some people off at a couple other places on the on the way. I think Cameron Bay was one of them. Uh, but yeah, we went to Chu Lai. I think it was about 40 miles away. We didn't spend we much tried. time 
I'm sorry, we didn't spend much time talking about your training, but that's the whole story itself. I think the AIT, the advanced training, that boot camp itself is an experience I like to talk about, but um, we're already in Vietnam, but um, so you, you're prepared, you're, you're there, but like I said, nothing can really prepare you for what you're in store for. So, you know, you're so, I guess you're naive in a sense, you're going into a war situation um, and realizing you're gonna soon be around um, a lot of people who are in need and, you know, wounded, wounded uh, soldiers, troops. Um, just tell me about the 91st EVAC, uh, your, your memory of that historically and just being there. What was that like going to the 91st? Well, of course, I didn't know what I was getting into <laughs> till I got there, but uh, the 91st was evidently the busiest in the war, about 800 patients a month. Matter of fact, that's the 91st in that behind me. Uh, they had about 112 medical officers and over 200 enlisted personnel. Uh, we had over 400 beds across ICU, post op, post op, the medical wards. We also had wards for Vietnamese soldiers, and citizens, and children, and even wounded VC prisoners. Now, I hadn't yet got my specific assignment the first night there, but an odd thing happened. We got woken up in the middle of the night. And I was in a bunk right beside the bathrooms in the latrine. And they found out that someone had put a trick wire bomb in one of the showers, one of the, uh, I'm sorry, stall doors, and it didn't go off. So that was my first not, uh, sleepless night in Vietnam at, at the 91st. Uh, so we all got out. They eventually found it, checked around. And I think I got back to bed about 3 a.m. and got up at 6 and reported for duty at uh, the uh, post-op surgical, post surgical ward. That experience kind of haunted you for a while, even was it in, even in the civilian life, didn't it? When you went into a bathroom or something? <laughs> yeah, anything with a stall. I, I would kind of, I know, first few weeks or months back, you know, I, I finally got back to going, I went back to college after I got out. And uh, I would check a stall for tripwires. It was just like second nature. Of course, you did it over there all the time. You never took anything for granted. Yeah. What rank are you at this time? I was a uh, Well, you Medical were a special. sergeant. You were a sergeant at some point. Was this when you were a sergeant? Yeah, I was a medical specialist, E3. And uh, I think, uh, you know, fresh out of training. Uh, I got promoted to E4 pretty quick, I think about three, four months. And then by uh, early in the second half of my tour, I made E5 which was a senior medical specialist. So, but you're so, a sergeant. A lot of experience. Pardon? You're, a, you're a sergeant. Yeah, it's equivalent of a sergeant, yeah. But you're a medical specialist. Uh, I didn't have men reporting to me or women, uh, but I was responsible for the junior medics, making sure they got trained uh, and so forth. We had a ward sergeant who, who did the scheduling and everything. And of course, uh, we worked hand in hand with the nurses on the ward. I've seen some pictures. Didn't you have sergeant stripes on, or maybe I'm imagining that? An E an E five is equivalent to a sergeant. Right. A so if I put down a rank for you. You want me to put medical specialist or sergeant? Just medical specialist E E five. So I would put medical specialist. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. So to start into your tour there, um, the types of wounds you were seeing, the patients you were around. Just give me some insight into that as a medic. Um, I, and you are a, a medic. Yeah, I was a medic. Yeah, combat medic. Uh, no, I, I. Well, everyone was considered combat, right? Because we were in combat zone. Uh, since the ninety first Steve Act was pretty far north during the day, uh, but I was a hospital medic. I right. really didn't see combat, although I'd done some rescue missions. Well, you saw the results of combat. That's 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 yeah. 
pretty eye-opening as a young man. So tell me about your experience at the 91st, what type of patients you would see in, in your work day to day and the hours that you worked. I know you worked long hours. We were, uh, everyone worked 12 hour shifts, six days a week. Uh, more if you had a mass casualty situation. Uh, if uh, we were light, you got a three hour break. Uh, you could do anything you wanted during that break, head down. The beach was right near us down the cliffs. Uh, so uh, typically you work nine to 12 hours. Uh, sometimes you work 24 to 48. It really depends on the situation. Uh, as far, I don't think anything could have prepared me for what we saw. Uh, the types of wounds were everything from a snake bite, a minor wound to frag wounds to uh, different types of fevers and illnesses, uh, all kinds of battle wounds, burns, uh, like from napalm, uh, burns that would you know go to the bone essentially, and a lot of amputees, single, double, quad, you name it. Uh, so we had a whole range of uh, of wounded there. Uh, typically, the wounded we typically the wound, wounded we would get would either come directly from uh, the ER if it were not major wounds. If they were really really bad, uh, they would go to ICU, and then once they stabilized, they come come into us. Now a lot of the people we had typically back in the States would be an ICU longer. Uh, so you, you got a lot of experience with a lot of different types of wounds and uh, uh, situations. Do you ever think about these people today, if they made it, if they're, how their lives were? I mean, do you, have, you ever prefer, reflect like that? Almost every day. You, especially you after, oh, especially after I wrote my book, you know, a lot of memories came back. Preparing for this interview, it came back. Uh, it's something you never forget. You emailed me last month, and you said you had watched Brian Bartlett or Doc Bartlett's story, the medic that I interviewed. Right? Is that right? Yes. And that probably. Did something to you, uh, obviously. Um, when you listened to that story, what were you thinking and feeling? Maybe your own experience there? Well, I, I guess we got to see two sides of the coin. I mean, conditions for a field medic uh, were really, really hard. Uh, you know, they had to act quick, like, quickly, you know, get the guy stabilized, get him to the evac, and get him to us where we took it from there. Of course, they were also under enemy fire themselves. So, you know, it's just hard to imagine that kind of a situation and what he had been through. But it did something to you. I mean, you contacted me, so you offered to share some, maybe of your experience at that time. So um, I don't know if you've talked about your experience. It seemed like there were a number of years where you didn't. Yeah, I think, the first time I share an experience, uh, I managed a group of people when I worked for at and And uh, there was a guy who worked for me, and this was in the 80s, late 80s. And we went drinking one night, celebrating a successful project. And we got to talking. I found out he'd been a helicopter pilot in July. And I had probably flown a mission or two on this helicopter. Uh, didn't know for sure, but he was flew in and out of our hospital quite a bit, delivering patients. Um, Wheatley. Yes, Dennis Wheatley, I'll never forget him. He was ramrod straight. He even looked like a helicopter pilot. He had done a lot of missions. Uh, we talked about, I mean, we'd had a lot to drink and that was the one time we talked about it. I don't think I talked to anybody else about it until I was probably in my 50s. 
I think that was pretty typical of uh, most people who went over there. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, just, um, and as I talk to you and all the, I think of all the interviews I've done and just, I can see it, it definitely affected you, changed you. Um, but um, so you're in, you're at Chulai, you're at, you're at the 91st EVAC and uh, Lou Eisenbrandt was a nurse there just a year before, or you said you probably crossed, your tours crossover, over, but she was a nurse there and you saw her story, I believe, but um, tell me, okay. Okay, I want a couple of things. Let's just go, let's go into Firebase Marianne and the mass casualty March of 70, I believe it was. Um, and tell me about that, the casual, there's a mass casualty incident and many were killed and wounded. So tell me about Firebase Marianne and the 46th Infantry Trier Regiment that was there. Well, that was early on in my tour. And I think, uh, we got a, a share of the patients. I, I tell you, I can remember very little about it. It was so much confusion. I was a new medic. I was just following the lead of the senior medics and nurses and helping out, and, you know, uh, later on helping change the wounds, uh, just to do a little bit of everything, really on the job training. But I was a junior medic when that happened. Uh, I will say, there, there was a mass, another, it was multiple mass casualties. That was the first one I remember very little about it. Uh, there was one later in my tour when I was a senior medic that I'll uh, never forget. And uh, it went on for 48 hours. We had people coming in. And uh, our nurses, had to go to help out in triage, ER, ICU. So we were left with, uh, we had our uh, post-op was two big Quonset huts, joined in the middle by our supply cabinets, the bathrooms, et cetera. And we had two medics and one nurse on each side, 30 beds on each side. And we, uh, got so many patients, we were putting them on litters underneath the beds. I don't know how many we had. We probably end up with well over 100 patients across the 60 bed capacity. A lot of people that normally would have been in ICU, we took because ICU was overloaded. Uh, I was a senior medic when that happened. This was a, uh, it was the uh, worst match casualty, uh, uh, even bigger than Firebase Mary Ann. And I can't remember the name of it. I don't even know if it had a name. Uh, we filled every bed. We had ambulatory patients on stretchers under the beds or in open areas. ICU was over capacity, so we got some of them. And uh, I remember being on duty, I think about 48 hours. And we each take a cat nap at the desk. Uh, the stress was unbelievable. And uh, I can't remember many of the details uh, other than when it was finally all over, because we were changing bandages, changing IVs, blood bags. Uh, we did CP, I helped with CPR a couple of times because uh, we were getting people that, you know, there's just not enough room to stabilize them in other areas. Uh, changing bandages, uh, you name it. And uh, more amputees than I'd ever seen at one time. Single, double, triple, quad, you name it. Burns. A uh, couple patients needed CPR. I was a senior medic. I helped out with that, helped a nurse. A lot of people in chest tubes, breathing regulators. So the noise, the moaning, and I, I'll never forget all that mixed together. Uh, and at most, you could get maybe five-minute cat nap something to wake you up and you'd have to go help out. Uh, finally, I think near the end of 48 hours, because some of the nurses and uh, or other experiences, some of the medics started coming back into the ward and we were relieved. And I remember sitting down in one of the wheelchairs and I just passed out. 
And I woke up later with an IV in my arm. I think it was a combination of exhaustion, dehydration, and just stress. I mean, we'd seen other mass casualties, but never anything like that. Um, uh, they sent me to see the psych, get a checkup, you know, make sure, you know, that's going to be okay. Day of, day of R&R, &R, and I came back to duty. And I think, like a lot of people that went through that, I was kind of emotionally numb after that. And you learned how to isolate yourself more from what was going on. But it just came on unexpected. I thought I had a lot of experience, had seen everything, but just the sheer number, I guess. So that's one I'll never forget. Your your personal interaction before or after that incident, I mean, did you, was it hard to not get close to a patient? I mean, when I see somebody without a limb or any type of injury, my heart goes out to them and you saw multiple uh, um, casualties. So was there anything during your tour, anybody that comes to mind that was maybe more personal than others? There were so many, but definitely one that stood out. Um, this was in the, again, in the latter half of my tour, it was before this mass casualty situation I just talked about. Uh, we had a guy come in, it was a uh, triple amp, amp PT, the possibility he might lose these other ones. And he was a patient for well over a month before we could stabilize him and, and transfer him to, uh, I think then they went to Japan and then to the States once they got better better situation. Uh, this particular soldier had climbed a guard tower when Firebase Marianne was overran. And guiding his men, you know, where to go, safety, uh, you know, everything that was going on. And uh, the tower got hit, I guess, a mortar and collapsed with him in it. And that's how he ended up when he got to us, you know, multiple, multiple amputee. Uh, I do remember incredible ability of the nurses to absorb a lot of things. They would uh, read him letters from his wife, former students, he used to be a teacher. And uh, they helped him regain the will to live. And uh, he made it out of there, he stabilized. And I think it was probably near the end of my tour, we got a letter from his wife thanking everybody there for taking care of her husband. He made it back home okay, went back to teaching, and they had a Polaroid of him in the wheelchair with his students around him. So that's one I'll never forget. Have you been in touch with him since? No, I tell you, I can't even remember his name. I can't remember a lot of their names. There's so many that came through. Uh, typically, they're, they were only with us a few days a week. He was with us, you know, I don't know, four or six weeks at least. Um, I mean, you really talked to the, the wounded. You got to know them. You joked around with them. But you tried, after a while, you tried not to absorb what they were going through. Uh, you just couldn't work 16-hour shifts, six days a week, and do that. Uh, so over time, you learn how to distance yourself. But, but he was the one I'll never forget. You don't, by chance, have that Polaroid picture, do you? No, that, that was, I remember that being put up uh, on the board at, at the hospital. I'm not sure. Where it ended up, we we got a number of pictures, as a matter of fact, from patients sent back to us. We were again one of the busiest, the busiest hospital in the war at that time. That's uh, that's a very uh, touching story, and I know you probably have others like that. And 
Um, you know, I've interviewed World War II nurses, and one of the things that really touched me about their stories is sometimes all the wounded soldier or Marine or whoever, sailor, airman, wanted was for someone to hold their hand. Um, and that was very touching when I would hear them say that. Um, not that you went around holding people's hands, but um, I'm sure you provided comfort to a lot of these patients. Maybe you don't even remember, but I'm sure in something you said or just being there for them, don't you think you provided some comfort for them? I, I hope so. I think a lot of just talking to them uh, more, so listening to them, you know, and uh, kind of empathizing with what they were going through, reassuring them. But I, you got better with experience, but you also had to isolate yourself from it. You know, you get a kind of a protective layer so you didn't absorb it. And know, and know you know, how to uh, get away from it when you were off duty. And there were a number of ways we did that. But the nurses were extremely professional. They absorbed it like a sponge and yet gave that attention and a carrying back. I never seen anything like it. I couldn't do it. Uh, just and, and of course they were doing things that uh, doctors sometimes did. You know, we just had enough doctors to go around and uh, they were working sometimes in the OR, they would suture up suture up patients, you know, close up for the doctor because it was so busy. ER they did just about everything. And of course, the same thing in our ward. They did a lot of things doctors were doing back in the States. And of course, we were doing a lot of things nurses and sometimes doctors were doing. You just did what was required. But the nurses were unbelievable. The, the ability to absorb everything the patients were going through, talk through them, talk to them, hold their hand, uh, joke with them when it, when it was needed. Uh, I mean, I, I just had the highest praise from the nursing staff. They were incredible. As you were talking about the long hours and the numbing, emotionally numbing and things, and then you, you briefly mentioned about unwinding, I couldn't help but think of the television series MASH. And I know you referred to that in your book, but uh, it was a little bit like that maybe, um, you know, off duty, on duty type behavior. Yeah, I think the it was different for everybody, but the common thing was the NCO club, everybody there, you know, went to drink, <laughs> you know, when you were not going to be on duty. And uh, about once a month, we'd have a USO band that would play a rock and roll band. Uh, matter of fact, I'll never forget one of the incidents, one of the things that happened there, uh, we had a medic, we called the Wolf Man. He had the long shaggy hair, it was his third tour over there. And he loved the music. He he loved the Vietnamese people. He he helped with a lot of the uh, missions to the local orphanages and stuff like that. He was a guy that really cared. Uh, but he loved the bands and the music. And I remember one time he asked the band near the end to uh, to play something from the Man of La, of La Mancha, the Impossible Dream. So the band started playing and then he started singing. He had an incredible voice. He brought the whole place down. Who would have thought this guy with shaggy hair, the third tour had a voice like that? He should have been on stage somewhere. So, you know, things, there was a lot, you know, like that, but that one, that one stood out. My favorite thing was to, uh, when we had the three hour break or, or you'd have the day off, it was to go down to the beach, climb down the rocks to the beach below. It was a very small beach, rocky cliffs, kind of like a bathtub area. You could soak and relax. And I love snorkeling. I buy a snorkeling outfit, you know, with the breathing device and so forth and the fins at the uh, PX. And I would go out there sometimes, snorkel for an hour, hour and a half, and just get lost in the coral forget everything. This is like floating weightless in space. So that worked better than anything for me. But uh, yeah, the music, uh, 
uh, we'd have party at the hooches, uh, like some of the officers had their, you know, would share, they had a hooch and our ward sergeant had one. So we'd have the parties once more. So we worked hard, we partied hard. Like again, that sounds like the television series, MASH. I don't like comparing music, uh, movies to real life, but so Bob, you were in Vietnam 405 days. You extended your tour. Um, you said those last 40 days were like an eternity. Um, so just tell me about that, your last days in Vietnam. Were you in, were, did you have a short time calendar like the infantry did, or did you just know that it was almost time to go home? And who decided that exact date? I didn't have a physical calendar, but I was ticking off the days in my head for sure. You kind of kept track. Uh, fortunately, toward the end of my tour, probably the last 20, 30 days, it wasn't very busy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the hospital was getting ready to stand down. And I don't know, I don't remember the time frame, but it was a couple months out at least. And uh, so I think we were down to under 100 patients, which was a fraction of what we would typically have across the whole hospital. And uh, uh, my two best buddies, they were getting ready to leave. I think I had told you we were called the three medics. We were like the three musketeers. So we were all going out of country about the same time. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of it was just drinking with people, saying your goodbyes. Uh, and uh, really looking forward <laughs> as the, the song we love the most in the, in the NCO club is we got to get out of this place. And I think we sung that, <laughs> we sung that a lot. Uh, it was mixed. We had the best friendships of my life. Uh, it transformed me. My views of women, what women could do radically changed with what I saw the uh, <clears throat> nurses who stepped up to. Uh, one of the medics I replaced early on uh, was a young black guy. Really, I remember I remembered him when I left. I remember, remember him when I, I came and when I left. And he had served three tours. He slim, maybe five, six. You wouldn't have thought anything about it, you know, normally. But three tours, Purple Heart, Bronze Star, and Silver Star. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. I only met him for maybe a half an hour on the ward. He was leaving. I was coming. But I, after I heard that story, I'll never forget him. Uh, Was his name uh, Mac or John? The last days were just a lot, a lot of remembering, saying your goodbyes, and wanting like heck to get back home. Because you were a short timer. You never knew when something was going to happen. And uh, as I said, our unit was going to eventually stand down. I, I just don't remember the time frame. I will say before I forget it, that I was went out of country at Cameron Bay. I had to stay over for a couple nights out on the beach because a lot of people were leaving in country at that time because we were moving from the north kind of to the south. And I heard that the unit had been wiped out by, of all things, a typhoon. I read many years later that it wiped out 80% of the hospital. Unfortunately, they got the 80 or 90 patients we had, everybody out. I think there was one civilian that, that was killed, uh, if I remember that in the, in the article. So uh, I do remember, it. evidently, I got out of there just in time. Uh, so it was kind of ironic. We withstood a lot. I think that hospital had been there uh, for a number of years, but as a 91st evac over two years. Matter of fact, I think as Lou Eisenberg had mentioned as well, the first nurse killed in Vietnam was killed on our ward. Uh, a few months, I think, after she arrived and she was working in uh, OR and ER, uh, 
and but she was killed on ward that uh, I worked on. It used to be a Vietnamese ward and was changed to post up. And she was like me from Ohio, so I'll never forget that story. As as you're talking, I'm just thinking, you know, and my perspective of what I've heard. I sometimes I feel like I was there, even with your story, because I've heard so many stories. Um, and I, I I know we could spend hours delving into these personal accounts, and I wish we had that much time, but I'm in no hurry to turn off a camera. But um, let, let's go ahead and talk about. I want to talk about your last. The, the trip home was it uneventful Did, i mean when you flew out you told me you flew from you know, here to here to here and you got there in the heat how about the flight home what 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 was the mood um who were you with and where did you fly from and to and just give me that flight home in your last day there when you left it was longer than the flight going there because <laughs> you really wanted to get back home uh and so I left from Cameron Air Base. Matter of fact, when I was getting on my flight, I met a guy from AIT who went to Airborne, figuring that the war would be over by the time I got out. And here he was coming in country as I was going out. I wished him the best, and I got on my flight, left. Uh, just a lot of people leaving. Uh, it was actually a United Airlines flight. It wasn't like a C-130 or anything like that, because we had to go to, I think it was uh, the Philippines, and then from there to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. So uh, in Fort Lewis, it was cold, windy, and rainy. i never forget that. And we were told to go stand in line to... Uh, get our uh, shave and a haircut. We weren't exactly uh, army regulation when we came came back. I had a Fu Manchu mustache. <clears throat> Problem is, uh, we left, it was about 100 degrees. When we got there, it was chilly and rain and snow flukes. And so I stood in line and like everybody else, you know, we got a regulation trim and haircut. I'll never forget that. And uh, Finally got on my flight uh, from there to Pittsburgh. I grew up in Ohio in the tri-state corner there. Uh, my wife met me. My parents weren't there because she wanted some time with me. In fact, we never told my parents for a week. <clears throat> so she met me there and we headed for a small apartment that to me seemed like heaven after where, where I was living. An odd story, uh, I caught pneumonia from having to stand out in line. So kind of the irony of that, right? Never, I never forgot that. Uh, you know, but I recovered. I took a, we'll say I took a job at a local pottery, which was a big industry where I grew up in Ohio and farming that tri-state area. And uh, started my next semester on the GI Bill while my wife worked. And I was just really glad to be home. I, I don't, other than that, I don't remember a lot about the flight other than I just wanted to get home. Well, tell me about that hug your wife gave you and that embrace. I mean, come on, you're newly married. You hardly saw each other. That had to be a pretty long hug, right? It was. <laughs> I told her it was the best hug of my life. Uh, and of course, people were watching us. A lot of us coming home. Uh, I had seen her on R and R halfway through my tour for a week, and it was hell going back, as it was for everybody. After you get a taste of civilian life, see the person you love. And like I said, we'd only been married a week before I left, so I kind of understood a little bit what World War II soldiers felt like. Not that what I experienced was anything close, but. Uh, I just, it was just amazing. All I remember was just her. Brings me to tears thinking about that. And she's still with me 53 years later. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a blessing, man. That's a blessing. Um, what, you've been to the Vietnam Wall. Tell me about your experience when you went to the wall and the, your reflection that you saw. <clears throat> yeah, just give me a second. Yep, yeah. take your time. Yeah, I waited quite a while to go. I went in 2009 and we met our family, my daughter, grandkids in, in DC. I went to first see the World War II in Korean because my dad and uncles had, went there, had been in those wars. And uh, then the wall. I think it's something like 58,000 names, two which I knew from high school, so I found them. A lot of other names of people that came to us in body bags or the few that we lost on the ward. And I remember, you know, one of the patients that I first had lost and it was odd, he had had a snake bite in the face. And it was early on in my uh, tour and I had to watch over him and try to cool him down. But uh, we were just, you know, trying to make him comfortable. He went into a coma and died when I was off tour. And I was just trying to remember his name and I just couldn't, I couldn't remember it. Uh, you know, and I wondered how many other names on that wall. Uh, A fact that I had read later, I didn't realize it. Uh, a lot, most of the people on that wall were 17 and 19 years old. Less than one, less than one year in the service. Including eight women, which was Sharon Lane I'd mentioned who had died shortly before, uh, uh, well, before, before Lou had went to the 91st and then it was killed in the same war I was at in 1969, I guess she was. Uh, during the walk, I thought about not only the losses, but how many went home with physical and mental trauma and hoping they got the help they needed. Uh, I, it was the longest walk of my life. I held up okay until the end. And it was my uh, daughter and granddaughter were waiting to give me a hug. And I lost it, <laughs> kind of like I'm doing now. But I thought back how many of them didn't get that opportunity. So I'll never forget that. You said you saw your reflection in the wall in your book? Yeah, I think I put a picture of it in my book. And uh, I remember taking that picture and seeing it later. And, I, you know, I thought about how lucky I was. You know, I had only done a couple rescue missions and lucky I, you know, I, I didn't get shot. I can't imagine what the combat medics and the dust off medics had went through. So I felt so fortunate that contrast of my shadow in the wall, you know, many years later, and a family waiting for me, when a lot of young men didn't have that opportunity. Bob, tell me about sights, sounds, and smells today that bring back Vietnam. Oh, my. Well, everybody will say the helicopter blades. For some, it meant the helicopter was coming to rescue them. For us, it meant they were they were coming and they were going to need our help. You know, I'd worked a few in the uh, missions in the uh, triage. I'd went on a couple dust off missions myself when the the medic on the helicopter had, had gotten wounded. Uh, so, uh, copter, those helicopter blades, I still hear one today. It has a whole different meaning for me and a lot of veterans, not only Vietnam, but every war since. Because 
that helicopter meant they were going to get to the hospital and hopefully saved in time. It, I mean, that made it made a world of difference. And those helicopter pilots flew under extreme conditions, not only uh, fire at night, uh, winds, storms, you name it, you know, that they went. Uh, the other thing was the sight of white phosphorus burns, napalm burns, children especially. Uh, you know, just right, you could see the bomb and smell the burn. I don't forget that. Uh, and just seeing so many young lives that were destroyed, not only physically, but mentally. The statistics vary. I read later something like almost as many people committed suicide after Vietnam as died in combat. It's either they didn't get the help, they were they're addicted to drugs, their wounds are so serious, their mental situation is so serious. So I think the number one thing we can do is just help the vets who come home. And, and we do a better job today, but we could still do more. Uh, I had an early friend over there who got addicted to uh, heroin because his wife had left him while he was over there. and. And uh, alcohol wasn't enough for him. He kind of got into the heavy drugs and heroin. And by the time he left, he was a scarecrow. And I, I that. And uh, the uh, heroin addiction when people came back from Vietnam was just horrible. So I just never forget those sights. I remember him when he came, he was a big burly guy. When he left, he was a scarecrow. Um, the patience. Um, the mental anguish you knew they were going through. And then there's the smells. I mean, say a scent is, brings back more memory than anything, and it's true. Uh, when I was in the recovery room, uh, January of last year, recovering from a quintuple bypass, I had all these tubes sticking out of me. I could smell my, there's a certain body odor after surgery mixed with the antiseptics. And of course, the sight of all the tubes hanging out of you. And uh, I'm, I could kind of see and smell this in myself. And it brought back all that. And I thought, how lucky I am to be alive. You know, make it this far, I'm going to make it, you know, again. And uh, so it was both scary and motivational at the same time. Uh, so I'll, I'll never forget the smells. Tommy, I want to share your book with my YouTube family. Um, a Medic's Tale of Transformation, a Vietnam War Experience. Tell me a little bit about your book and the title. Where did you, how did you come up with the title? Well, first, I, I look back after a distance from it, you know. I typically didn't think, a, you try to forget about it your first years back, get on with your life. I graduated with, with a comp sci degree with honors, went on to a really good job at Bell Labs and a career and family, a lot of them didn't get to have. Uh, and I thought about it from time to time, the, the wall brought a lot back. Uh, but being in a recovery from open heart surgery really brought it back. And uh, I, the realization hit me, my friends and family didn't know anything about it. They knew I was a medic <laughs> and I had been there over a year because people didn't ask and we didn't want to talk about it for a long, long time. Uh, I thought, you know, I could have, died on that operating table and they wouldn't know. So it kind of motivated me to, to kind of write it all down, not just for them, but for me. And a lot of the people went through far worse than I did. So my theme in telling the book was the mistakes I made as a young man that sent me there. 
the things I learned about the people, the experience that made me a man when I turned 21. Put everything in perspective. Much more motivated and dedicated when I came out. So it transformed me. I had more empathy. I understood what how women were undervalued, especially nurses, and yet what they could do. They brought a lot of patients back to life by holding their hand and talking to them. Besides the skill, yeah, the amazing skills. So I wanted to put that, those experiences, people I met, and it's a short memoir, it's like a novella, because my other motivation, I didn't, I wanted to write it down quick, edit it, and kind of hand it to my friends and family. Uh, about those experiences, but more about what I gained as a human being from it and how lucky I was to make it back in one piece. Uh, but it just made me a better person. So many ways. And uh, so thankful for the family and friends I got to have the future I got to have. Uh, a writer friend of mine uh, was in, interviewing me because she was going to, in her book, which wasn't about Vietnam, one of the characters was going to be an ex-Vietnam medic about my age. So we talked about it. I said, you know what? I've been writing this book. You know, just if you want to see that, that'll tell you a lot as well. And she encouraged me to, to publish it on Amazon, which I did. And so a lot of my friends bought it, Facebook friends. And of course, I donated the uh, the proceeds. It wasn't a big hit. You know, it was a small personal piece uh, to save the children because of all the children and the orphans that I saw there. God bless you for that. That's amazing. Um, we're going to we're going to begin to wind down here, but um, I'm just so grateful to, to talk with you. It really, really is a blessing. Um, Thank tell you. me. You know, you've, if you've seen some of my interviews, you know, at the end, I'll ask a couple of questions with all my veterans. And the first question is, Bob, being a, a Vietnam veteran and an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? Well, first is the price that we all pay for freedom. And I, and I mean, we all. Uh, Clearly, those who served in war, especially like World War II, especially. It gave me, this gave me a much more relatable experience to what my dad and my uncle went through. They paid the highest price. Uh, but for me and, and the perspective I've gotten out at 74, I think the best way we can honor them is to set aside our differences, recognize them, but set them aside, and ensure that future generations have the equal opportunities and the healthier, safer life. That means a lot of different things to different people, but and it's hard in today's world, you know, with extremes and a lot going on. But uh, I th we can do it, and I think the greatest threat to our freedom. Now is the unwillingness to compromise on the issues and find a common ground uh, across this wonderful, diverse country. Now you can probably hear my concerns. I've seen a lot from the '60s on, right? And uh, the war I was in, the Mideastern War, Afghanistan. You know, relatives and friends have went through that. So I'm concerned with everything going on. And you know, climate crisis on top of it, so many challenges. But I'm also hopeful that we can all rise to the greater need because I've seen people do it. And over there, it didn't matter your race, your religion, your belief, the color of your skin. People joined to do what was required. And I think we, we as citizens need to learn how to do that, not just in wartime. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? I'm sorry? What does the American flag mean and represent to you? It, 
it means a lot. I mean, I consider myself a patriot, but in the broadest sense, because I think you don't have to just serve in a war to be a patriot, be a fireman, a nurse, a lot of ways you can contribute to serve both your community and your country. So I, I am a patriot, but I see patriotism in a very broad sense. I don't quite trust the politicians who wrap themselves in a flag and claim to be patriotic, uh, especially if they never served. But as long as you treat, you're treating others the way you'd like to be treated, that makes you a patriot. Bob, what do you want to be remembered for when you're gone someday? Being a great father and grandfather. My family means everything. And my experiences made me who I am. Well said. Tell me what happened to the other two medics. Three medics, what happened to the other two? Are you in touch with them? We stayed in close touch for about a decade and then kind of our lives sent us different ways. Uh, the one, uh, uh, he went back to being an engineer and, and uh, got married, had a really good job. Uh, the other one who used to be a teacher changed careers altogether. He, matter of fact, went to Australia for a while. Uh, he had a hard time going back to the States and, and adjusting. He went to Australia, uh, met his bride-to-be. He ended up working in the State Department in the Caribbean. So he had you know, pretty good. So they both had pretty good lives. At the last, but it's been, it's been a long time. But it was just good to hear that, you know, they did good. Anything else you might have wanted to share if you have notes there or whatever? Is there anything that maybe I didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? We've just got a few minutes left. I think we I had very brief notes up on my screen. You covered it all. And I really appreciate you helped me through it. I, I don't think I could have told a story without. I mean, you've been through a number of these, right? You know the questions to ask and that they were right on. I appreciate that. Well, the feeling's mutual. You guys are my motivation for my work. I've been doing this 21 years. Wow. Um, lost a lot of troops. I've, my ranks have grown thin through all the stories that I've done. Um, that's the hard part of my work. But uh, I'm just grateful for you and you coming forward and, and telling your story. And, and I will be a good steward of that story on my Voices of History channel and radio station. And many, many thousands of people, I can guarantee you, will be touched by your story and I want you to take some ownership in that because um, it's not in vain you know all this is there's a reason for all this I I, I really appreciate the work you do and, and this opportunity to talk about it. Uh, I've seen a number of the interviews and it, it's just a fantastic tribute to those people who serve we we appreciate that kind of well, my trademark and my signature is at the very end when I ask for a salute. I know the protocol in the military for salute, but from where you're at right there in South Carolina, could you, when I ask you to look into the camera and just give a salute into the camera, if you want to say something, if not, just let's end this with a salute. It's been 53 years, but I think I remember how. And I salute you back. God bless you, brother. Thank you. God bless you.